Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Deepak Dayama. I'm a product manager here in the Amazon uh, Container Services team. Uh, we'll be talking about a deeper dive into container networking. With me, I have Shakil Sorathia. He is uh, VP of Engineering at Fox uh, Digital Consumer Group. Uh, he will be sharing his experience working with ECS and scaling for networking for microservices architecture uh, and uh, some of the lessons they've learned and, and uh, some of the best practices as well. Um, so I'll just uh, kick off. This is a 400 level uh, session. We will cover uh, container networking with Amazon ECS. Uh, the first uh, mode that we will talk about is the bridge mode, uh, which uh, if you're familiar with container networking, is sort of the most popular uh, mode that you have been using with ECS. It's sort of the de facto. And uh, a recently introduced, just two weeks ago, uh, task networking mode, or as we call syntactically being correct, uh, AWS VPC mode. And then Shaquille will go over uh, the, the story at Fox with respect to networking for microservices. So this is a 400-level uh, course, 400-level uh, session. So it assumes familiarity at some level with respect to either VPC or containers or networking, one of, you know, one of the three. And uh, I can quickly uh, bring up to speed with respect to some terminology that I will use uh, in, the, in the rest of the session. So if you're not familiar with ECS, but you're familiar with containers and networking, uh, this should just resonate uh, with you. So first is an elastic network interface. If you're running an EC2 instance in Amazon VPC today, uh, you're using an elastic network interface. Uh, it uh, enables your routing to the rest of the world and within the VPC and within the AWS cloud itself. Uh, each ENI uh, gets its own uh, private IPv4 address, um, and optionally, you can also get a public address or a IPv6 address or secondary addresses. Um, and you can configure your security groups on a per ENI level for the application that you're running. So you can configure the inbound or outbound access uh, that you should be uh, having. So let's talk about some of the ECS constructs we will discuss. The first is a task definition. Uh, a task definition is uh, essentially a defines a unit of an application that you want to run using containers. Usually, you want to run containers uh, together, whether they support each other or for logging purposes or uh, any other utility purposes, or they're just uh, built that way. So the task definition enables you to define that uh, application, how those containers uh, network, and which images they use, and you define the CPU and memory requirements at the container level. Here's the Amazon ECS cluster. Uh, a cluster is a logical isolation uh, for every task that you're running in your ECS. So in, in an ECS cluster, you can register EC2 instances that you're running. They, so I will, I will also refer to them as ECS instances. And once they are registered, you have set up your auto-scaling group. You can start running tasks on them. Until yesterday, that was the only way you could run containers on ECS. We launched Amazon AWS Fargate yesterday. And with that, uh, you, while you don't have to register EC2 instances anymore, it remain, the cluster remains a, this administrative boundary within which you can run your applications. So you can still control who can uh, view or run tasks within this cluster with the Fargate launch type. So a task is a instantiation of your task definition that you just defined. You can take a same task definition uh, for the same application run within different clusters for different environments, if you're running dev, prod, uh, and so on. And then we have a notion of a service in ECS, where a service is essentially a managed task. You can define the state, the desired state of your application with ECS's service, uh, service uh, scheduler. So you can say, I want to run n number of these tasks as a minimum across three different availability zones for resiliency. 
and ECS maintains that state for you, uh, may, checks on the task health. If a task dies, it spawns a new one to maintain your desired uh, count in that sense. And if you are uh, see, observing uh, a lot of uh, load on your existing tasks, it's also able, able to launch more tasks uh, based on those metrics. So here's an example of the task definition. Uh, here we have uh, defined the name of the uh, name of the containers, the CPU and memory requirements, and the port mappings. That I want to use port 80 exposed from this container with the protocol TCP. Uh, we'll quickly come to how that uh, translates into the task level uh, port mappings. But each container defines its uh, own container port mappings. So let's talk about the container uh, networking modes with ECS. As I mentioned earlier, there, there's a bridge and a task networking mode. There are two more modes that, uh, that are there. One is a host mode where essentially containers use the host network stack. And all interfaces from the host will be available to the container. Uh, obviously, from a network isolation standpoint, uh, that has not been a, a very popular choice. And then the, the other mode that I have not spoken about yet is the none, where you don't really need any networking. You're writing something locally. Uh, and that's really the purpose of life of that container that you're running. Uh, and that works for that specific you know, small set of use cases. Uh, so with that in mind, I will only focus on the bridge mode and the task networking mode as uh, we see these two as the dominant ways of uh, deploying your uh, containers and networking them. So let's do a quick uh, primer of the bridge mode. Uh, a bridge mode is, in a bridge mode, containers share the same network interface as the instance. Uh, you may have uh, not only multiple containers here. In this case, uh, you have two different uh, tasks. Uh, and they, they can share the same ENI that is allocated to your EC2 instance. And uh, it's the same uh, single network namespace for that purposes. So let's do a quick uh, packet walkthrough of uh, how the bridge networking mode works. Each container gets its own network namespace. Uh, containers are connected to each other. Um, and the global default namespace via the Docker zero bridge here. And each, con and each container it's, it's scoped IP, has a scoped IPv4 address. Now, that IPv4 address is not a routable address. Its, own, its uh, significance is only local to uh, the task and be able to talk to containers uh, within the task, for example. You need to go through Docker Zero Bridge for any, any external communication. So let's look at, uh, here we have a packet um, that we want to send from uh, 10.0.0.2.7 to 10.0.0.2.6. And uh, know that the packet's destination cannot be the IPv4 address of the container here. And that's because, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's no significance of that address outside. So, here we have the first, the first hop for the packet is going to the Docker zero bridge. Um, the Docker for forwarding rules on the bridge forward this packet out to the ETH zero interface, which is seen in the next diagram. Here, VPC, because this is ENI and it, ENI is a VPC construct, which you use for EC2 instances as well. Now, VPC does its magic of routing uh, using your routing table rules that you have set up, whether if this is. In this case, it's within the same subnet, so it should be local. And it's sent to the eighth zero destination of the other, uh, the other task, or in this case, EC2 instance. The forwarding rules on the target instance uh, forward this packet to the Docker zero bridge now, just like it was on the, the egress on the other side of the task. Um, and similarly, the Docker zero bridge uh, has, the, has the rules to be able to send, route it to the, uh, the con destination container. So this is a quick uh, packet walkthrough. Uh, let's look at uh, how this works with load balances as well. I talked about service, uh, ECS service earlier. Uh, you can register an ECS service uh, with an, a load balancer. 
where uh, the ECS scheduler is aware of uh, of this uh, of this fronting of the from the load balancer and is able to register tasks of the service as they come up as the backends of the of the load balancer. So in this case, uh, you have uh, here uh, ta two tasks, and each task has a port 8080 and a port 80, and they are exposing uh, the, those tasks as is to the uh, to the load balancer. In this case, I could just be using the port 80 for the private ENI IP uh, for task one and task two because uh, they are distinct. The security groups uh, that I will configure on each of these instances would be to allow both port 80 and port 8080 because um, I, it has to be include all the containers that are running on the instance. So if I have more tasks running on these instances, uh, it should be uh, ensure that all of those ports are opened up. But what if I have multiple web applications? Uh, you may have applications, and because containers enable you to have a smaller footprint, it is likely that you may have applications trying to expose the same port. So the solution there is to, uh, for maximum flexibility, uh, to assign a port to each container automatically uh, when Docker assigns, and Docker assigns that random port to a container. So you accomplish this in the ECS task definition here on the right uh, by specifying the host port uh, to leaving the host port to be zero. So let's look at uh, what happens if I have to have these two applications exposing the same ports, uh, but they are uh, you know, sharing the same container instance in this case. So this is the uh, manifestation of, of your previous configuration. You specified host port zero, and the Docker assigns uh, this mapping of what the external IP port to internal instance, uh, internal container port uh, should be. The ECS scheduler, at the time of scheduling these tasks, is aware of these port uh, requirements. So to avoid conflict, so you may have a large number of instances, and you want to uh, load a lot of tasks on it, so it's aware of the ports as a resource of the instance before placing the task. So this works well, and there are, however, challenges here. Um, as you saw earlier, every packet has to go through the Docker Zero bridge, so there are, uh, there's an additional hop on each side uh, that is being added uh, for that lookup for the routing uh, for the routing rules. There's also, as I mentioned earlier, you may have multiple applications, and you need to be aware of what those applications are running on your EC2 instance, and the security group should be configured in a way to allow all of those. So you have lack of this finer uh, grain access control policy when it comes to configuring your security group. And especially if you look at a dynamic port mapping, uh, you now have to be aware of what that permissiveness should be, which makes you comfortable. So that's something to uh, keep in mind. And lastly, these are not routable addresses uh, for your task. Uh, they are essentially, uh, logically speaking, on the same, uh, same network. Uh, and, and, and you don't uh, get the, if, you, if your requirement is to have network level isolation, uh, that may not meet your requirements. So let's talk about the AWS VPC mode. Uh, we launched this on 14th of November. Uh, we are very excited about this. It is based on, uh, so this is nice ASCII art here. Um, this is a proposal on GitHub that we proposed some time ago. The ECS agent is an open source uh, software that runs on all EC2 instances that are registered with the ECS cluster. And this is part of the ECS agent uh, proposal that we put out. Uh, there recently, in the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, uh, they adopted a, uh, for a specification for container networking. It's called Container Networking Interface. So that's the logo to the top right. And it specifies how 
you should implement your uh, container networking to be uh, CNI compliant, CNI, to meet the CNI, CNI spec. So we adopted that. But we asked ourselves, um, how do we make this better? How at least we can do to relieve the pain points? Uh, and we came up with exactly that. There's already a very good solution built to help customers with networking. Uh, that is VPCs. You don't need to think much today when it comes to routing between your instances within the VPC and communication between them in the same subnet. So our goal was to provide EC2-like uh, container capabilities to the task. We have seen uh, features like task IM role, uh, similar to EC2 instance role, uh, being added at the container level to really make the task a first level primitive when it comes to compute capabilities within the AWS cloud. And this is uh, exactly an evol uh, evolution of that. So, we, so the solution here is that we will uh, allocate an ENI interface to each task. We launched AWS Fargate yesterday, and the AWS VPC mode, uh, as we call it, is the only mode that, sh that works with AWS Fargate. It is because in Fargate, you have, essentially, you, you run your ECS containers just the way you do today, just that you don't have to manage ECS, EC2 instances anymore. So what this means is, but you still want to have complete network isolation to be able to uh, control the policies for your task. So that's why AWS VPC mode just makes sense uh, for Fargate as the only mode here. So here's a configuration of the AWS VPC mode here. Um, you specify the network mode, and as part of the uh, VPC configuration, uh, configuration, you specify your subnets and security groups that you want attached uh, to the ENI. So here's the task definition that is created. Um, you will notice that in the task definition, we have specified the mode, but we have not specified the subnet or VPC. Uh, it's because the subnet is really a placement time or runtime decision that you can make. So you can define your applications in a uniform way and choose to run them uh, wherever you need to in terms of network boundary uh, within your own VPCs. So a capability is added here to your, uh, to your task, which is a task ENI. Here is the run task. Uh, if you want to run a standalone task, uh, this is the command you will use. You will also specify a launch type if you want to run it as Fargate. And you have specified the subnets here that you want us to place the task in. The ECS scheduler is aware of the instances running in those subnets if you're running EC2 launch type uh, when, when placing this task. So here is right after you create the task. This is the status uh, that is there. So ECS has pre-created the, the task networking interface for you, um, and it has allocated the subnet ID and the, uh, and the task ID to it. So looking under the hood, what exactly happens to my network interface when it is allocated? The primary ENI, uh, which comes with the instance, is in the default namespace, the default network namespace. And the new ENI that is created for this task uh, is added, uh, and it starts off in the default namespace. We have built the ECS agent uh, so that it uses the it uses Linux. It actually offloads the networking setup to the CNI plugin that we have built. Uh, the CNI plugin is a set of executables whose sole purpose is to configure networking for containers, and then it goes away. So the CNI plugin has now provisioned your a new ENI in a new network namespace, and then it's done. 
So what this really means is while having tasks for your networking interface, those capabilities are really powerful, you don't have to manage these attachments yourself. The ECS control pane does all the heavy lifting of the life cycle of ENI as part of your task creation. Likewise, the life cycle of to clean up these resources once your task has terminated is taken care of. So now that our task is attached, let's look at the details. You will see that the, in addition to the subnet ID, we have now allocated the network interface ID. It's like any other net ENI that you use. You can go and look it up in your ENI, uh, describe ENI call, and uh, you get a private uh, IP address and a MAC address. So let's look at the packet path now with task ENIs. In the same VPC, we now want to route from 10.0.0.27 uh, to 10.0.0.29. So there is no bridge hop. So as soon as the, inter the packet reaches ETH1, uh, VPC does its thing, and it's routed to the to the ENI of the other task. Uh, the container immediately sees it and processes it. And that's it. Furthermore, if your security groups don't allow it, the packet never reaches 10.0.0.2.9. So your security groups can be specific to your task definition in this case. Uh, and you don't have to worry about other port conflicts and, and, and such. Uh, there is no overlay, no port translation to be done in addition, no proxy. So this is incredibly powerful. Especially when you tie this into how you communicate with other AWS services, uh, or when you use, for example, the network load balancer, where the security group of the task is also the security group of the load balancer, um, and how you communicate with resources that are provisioned within uh, your VPC, for instance, your task this becomes this uh, first-class object to be able to talk to uh, those resources as well. So let's do a quick demo of task networking. I will use Fargate in this case. Uh, let me just bring it up. I don't think it switched over. It did? Okay. It's not switched over yet. There we go. It's lunchtime. <laughs> it is. Let me just set it up here. There you go. Okay. Yeah, thanks. So here I have, uh, I'm using ECS CLI. ECS CLI is, uh, we launched version 1.1 of that yesterday along with Fargate. And what ECS CLI does is it takes care of a lot of the uh, setting up of your clusters, VPCs, uh, using cloud formation. And uh, that way your interaction with uh, setting up your task or services in ECS is really simplified. So I'm just showing here a compose file to define my application here. It's task networking Fargate. I'll just call it demo. And I have specified the image that I want to pull and the ports. I've, uh, I'm just using 80, uh, port 80 here. And so let's just set up. All I have to do is ECS CLI compose up. It brings up a new task for me. Uh, in this case, I've set it up as a Fargate task. Uh, I 
initially before this presentation, I set it up as, as a default type of Fargate. So whenever I launch a task, I don't have to specify that. And while this comes up, let's look at what the networking configuration behind this application definition in Compose file looks like. So this is, this is the ECS parameters uh, specific to, uh, to the ECS that we have defined here. The networking mode is AWS VPC mode, and we have defined the subnets and the security groups I want. Now in case of, if you're running a Fargate task, you also have public IPs that you can request. Uh, we will be also looking at supporting public IPs for uh, ECS, uh, EC2 launch type tasks. So if you go to the cluster here, the cluster is, is heterogeneous. So you have Fargate services running in it, and it's also EC2, in, EC2 uh, launch type services running here. If I go over here, I can see all the task services that I have defined and the standalone tasks. Uh, let's look at the status of our task uh, and where it's coming up. As you see, you can define your EC2 as instances. I don't have any. I, I'm just running Fargate tasks, so I don't need to register any EC2 instances uh, in this case. And the only way you can run Fargate tasks is by defining your own VPC and your own subnet. So while you don't have visibility uh, or you, while you don't have to manage the underlying infrastructure, you uh, will always run within your own defined network boundaries. Let's go back to the tasks. And here we have the Fargate task running. Let's look at the ID over here. So this is the task ID that was created. So 9FE. And if I do ECS CLI, PS, it shows me the new demo task that was created. It has a public IP. I can go to the public IP, and it has my task up and running. Now, from a task definition point of view, it's as simple as that. Uh, you only define your subnets and VPC, and task just runs in that boundary. So, um, so that's it for the demo. Let's switch back to the presentation. So now that we looked at the capabilities we have with task networking and AWS VPC mode, uh, which one should I choose? You should consider using the AWS VPC mode uh, for services that are attached to the application load balancer, network load balancer, and you don't want to worry about uh, managing the uh, ENI attachment or the, or the port, uh, port mappings. We will, we will also be working on uh, enabling migration from your existing bridge mode to a task networking mode so that you can use the same services backed by the same load balancers and be able to do that update. Um, but there's a consideration here and caveat that you should be aware of is these are running on EC2 instances. So if you're running in EC2 launch type, you need to be aware of which EC2 instances you're running, what is the ENI limit, which is specific to that instance, and how many tasks you plan to, plan to bin pack into that instance. So if your task outnumber, uh, task networking may not uh, be able to place tasks because there wouldn't be an ENI resource. So ECS scheduler is aware of that. Uh, an alternative is to just run Fargate because we take care of that uh, for you. So you don't have to worry about these specific limits uh, for the EC2 uh, instances. So with that, uh, I will turn it over to Shaquille, who can share a little bit about his story. Cool. Thanks, Deepak. Um, hi, my name is uh, Shaquille Sarathia I'm with Fox. Uh, before I get started, I will say that, yes, I do have my friends who call me Shaq, and I have no relationship to Shaquille O'Neal. Um, although we do probably have the same free throw percentage, so it's about that. So anyways, um, I'm with 21st Century Fox, uh, and about 21st Century Fox, if you guys don't know, um, we're kind of a small company, uh, global portfolio of cable and broadcasting networks. I just pulled that 
blurb from our uh, investor page. So you can read that if you want. But the, the highlights here is that you know, we have uh, channels across the world, um, some very popular ones, especially domestically, uh, Fox Sports, um, FX, National Geographic, things like that. So um, that's 21st century as a whole. And then the specific organization inside of Fox that I represent is the Digital Consumer Group, um, DCG. And we're an organization that's really just tasked with the digital delivery of, um, uh, of our content to consumers. So on the right there, you can see a couple of images of what we're delivering. So what that is, is the um, Fox Now application uh, that you can download on your iPhone, uh, Roku, whatever, or just go to it on the web, and you can watch um, Fox content uh, with your um, uh, cable provider. So if you have Comcast, uh, DirecTV, what have you, you can log in with your provider and watch the content. And there's also free content there. So this is the application that we are actually uh, delivering to our end users. So there's really two components of it. What you're seeing here is obviously the front end. Um, and because we have a number of front ends, whether it be web, mobile, connected device, what have you, we deliver everything through a common API layer. So what I'm really gonna talk to you guys about is the common API layer um, and how we deliver that. Now, there's a lot more um, services that we end up utilizing. Um, however, I just wanted to kind of show what we're kind of, how we're delivering it as it relates to, um, uh, to this presentation and, and to ECS in general. So first of all, everything that we're doing all of our experiences are running out of AWS. Um, we're utilizing API Gateway uh, to actually deliver all of our APIs. We are a uh, microservice um, architecture with our services that are written in uh, Node.js and Go. And we have different teams that deploy things differently. We have some teams that um, mostly we're utilizing Terraform, but we do utilize CloudFormation for certain things. Uh, some teams deliver multiple services at once. Other teams deliver single services. And this is going to be important because we'll run through some of the, the challenges here. And then um, everything is delivered through uh, ECS. So we're, we're fully Dockerized, and um, we're delivering everything through ECS. So some of the challenges that we've run into, and, and I think Werner's kind of you know, spoke about it a little bit this morning too, that as you move forward, you kind of have to evolve your architecture, right? So every time you kind of step through, you evolve. So our architecture was probably initially uh, developed about a year ago, year and a half ago. And so as we've kind of grown, um, more, more people coming to our applications, you know, we've had to also evolve. And so a lot of the challenges that we faced has been things like, well, we do have a microservices architecture, lots of services, and we're utilizing bridge mode. Um, and we've got hundreds of instances, right? So um, that, that's a scale issue there. Um, some of the other challenges are were that teams needed to be able to determine how to write, or write route, now they need to write services too, but route an individual service between a blue, green, purple, orange, red, what have you, uh, deployment. Um, we also needed to be able to route um, a single request anywhere through the stack um, to a specific service, maybe for testing, it might be for um, some type of a feature. Imagine if, you, if you're deploying a feature to 2% of your um, users and that feature is potentially you know, a microservice that's three layers deep. How do you make sure that you know, you've selected that feature up front but now you've routed it to the right area? So those would be challenges too. Um, we have to maintain multiple versions of the same service uh, because, as many people know, you run your apps, not everybody updates at the same time. So uh, we have to, main, we have to you know, maintain different versions of, of our uh, APIs. We're very ephemeral. Um, we want to be able to deal with failure you know, pretty much at any level, you know, services, containers, anything can go, and um, you know, we have to be able to, to, to manage that. So, what did we look at in order to um, kind of deliver some of these things? Um, so again, 
one, one very common way is put some ALBs in front of the microservices, um, but you run into certain limitations. You know, one of the limitations is that target groups will have a limit of 1,000 targets. Um, you can change that. We have, but you know, that's, that's something you have to be uh, cautious of about. Um, this does end up leading to hundreds of ALBs, and you know, if, you're, if you've worked with um, API Gateway, then there's a lot of complexity in the integrations, and then you've got development, stage, load, production, all these different environments that you might be going to. So you've got tons of variables there. Um, so it just, you know, I think you could definitely deal with it in terms of um, the automation, but it does start to get fairly complicated. Um, another thing that we looked at was saying, okay, well, let's just get rid of that, and let's talk directly from one microservice to another microservice utilizing DNS. Another, another way that um, you can do that, it does, um, I'm sure there are some systems engineers in here, and as any systems engineer has known, we run into many, many um, debates around naming schemas and what metadata you want to put into the DNS structure, and at some point, you forgot to put this one metadata, and now how do you do that? You change the whole structure for everybody. So those were going to get very complicated to try to think those things out. Um, so another way was to say, well, let's, let's take something in between here um, and uh, utilize software to create a service mesh. And this is actually what we ended up doing. Um, so what is a service mesh? Um, it's a dedicated infrastructure layer for making service-to-service -service communication sa safe, fast, and reliable. Um, so what that means is you are, you are going through some layer of software that can find your services, right? So utilizing some form of service discovery allows a service mesh software to route requests to a healthy instance of a specific service. So if you've got service A, trying to talk to service B, um, we would go through the service mesh layer. It would find out where service B is. Again, you have to do some type of service. I should mention one, one thing really quickly is that most people will you know, you talk about a microservices architecture, and we always talk about it at the application level, that we're delivering our application through microservices. But it, you can actually take that a step deeper into the stack and almost think of your infrastructure as microservices, which is what we, that, and that's the reason I'm really only talking about the service mesh, because that's that layer. You know, your service discovery is a different microservice, if you will. Your registration into service discovery is a different microservice. So you can really kind of just plug in different pieces that may make sense. And that's why we're kind of used like, um, uh, did it like this. And, and the software that we elected to utilize is Linkerd. There are other bits, there are other, you know, bits of software that are out there. Um, two that come to mind is I, um, IO, how do you pronounce that? Istio? Istio, um, um, Envoy. Uh, so there, there's a lot of other things that are out there. We chose Linkerd. Um, it, uh, it fit a lot with what we're doing. It fit with um, our microservices infrastructure layer. But, you know, by all means, it's, it's just, a, it's just a, a concept there. So let me show you at a very high level. Um, and the next couple of slides are going to be more around the actual diagrams. And I was kind of debating, like, do you show high level and then detailed? Or do you go detailed and then high level? Neither one really seemed right. I flipped a coin. It landed on heads. Heads is high level. So there we go. Um, so this is what kind of our um, from the top down looks like. So we'll have the internet or applications that are attached to the internet, if you will. Um, they will go to Amazon, Gate or Amazon API Gateway to hit a specific API endpoint. From there, now, everything goes through a single load balancer. Um, API Gateway has to talk to a load balancer, so it goes through a single load balancer. And one comment I want to make here is, is that, I don't know if you guys have used um, network load balancers at all, uh, but if you are doing classic ELBs and trying to do TCP uh, so you can get directly to your um, instances, I would highly recommend NLBs. Um, they're a little bit lighter, faster, uh, and, and they're pretty cool. So we have switched that over to an NLB now, which basically load balances across a layer of Nginx servers. Um, and that's all running ECS. Uh, the communication, if you look at it, uh, if, you, if you're familiar with it, um, 
And now, right now, and I'm sure that uh, the, the, the folks at uh, Amazon will eventually fix this, but currently, uh, API Gateway can only talk to a publicly exposed internet-facing NLB, and so, or internet-facing load balancer, not yet a VPC endpoint. So the way to secure your communications um, is through a client certificate. Again, ALBs actually can't process client certificates, so if you're actually in this mode, you're either utilizing classic EC2 or um, ELBs, or you'd want to go NLB and have to terminate SSL on your instances. So that's what we're doing. Nginx uh, effectively terminates um, SSL uh, there, and the network load balancer lives in the public subnet. Uh, everything there, and I kind of noted there that while they look different here, they could be the same set of physical servers. It doesn't really matter. You can choose, um, you know, the, there's, there's definitely reasons why we would make those different um, in the sense that you may have different networking needs. Uh, you, know, you can use different um, congestion algorithms on different ECS servers if you need to, uh, to you know, reduce, reduce uh, time to delivery and things like that. And then below, we have all of our Fox um, DCG microservices. So to go into the, um, uh, we'll note that this all lives in a single uh, VPC, and we have multiple uh, subnets, all the ECS, Servers live in a private subnet, and the only thing that lives in the public subnet is the load balancer. So now the detail of this is how do the services communicate? Um, so I pulled, again, there's a lot in here. There's a lot of other things that actually live there. So I pulled all of that out to kind of just show the pieces here that actually um, uh, we're utilizing for this. So the way that it works, is that, again, I mentioned all the ECS nodes live inside of a private subnet. It could be multiple AZs, it could be a single AZ, what have you. So when service A wants to talk to service B, what we've done is we've loaded Linkerd onto every ECS instance. So there's one Linkerd per instance. So every container, we, we don't run it as a sidecar, we run it as a, you know, on an instance basis. So every container talks to the local Linkerd. One of the reasons why is once you start getting, you know, hitting a lot of scales or hitting a lot of containers, you just, you know, you'd have a ton of sidecars potentially. So right now we just run a, a single one that could change. Again, not a not a uh, not a hard uh, and fast rule for us. Um, it talks to Linkerd through the um, through the Docker bridge. So that's how it knows every instance finds its Docker bridge in order to talk to uh, Linkerd. It talks to it on its um, Docker bridge, and off it goes. Linkerd will say, okay, you want to talk to service B, right? And what it'll do is it'll, it'll find um, a healthy, right? it'll go and basically query our service discovery backend. It will find a healthy instance, and then it'll proxy the request over to that instance. Um, that, uh, that task will then uh, do whatever it needs to do, return back to Linkerd, Linkerd will come back to the service, and uh, the service is not none the wiser that it actually went through anything. It just understands that it made a, a request, and it got serviced. Um, now, so that's kind of the, uh, the really the, the implementation details on that. This next slide here is basically saying everything that I just talked about. Um, so uh, I tend to do this because if somebody watches it on some YouTube, at least it's there and you don't have to hear the audio. Um, I know my voice gets annoying to me too. So um, ECS instances reside in private subnets. Service containers are deployed through ECS. Container instances utilize the ECS optimized AMI. And then we add Linkerd uh, through our user data. So it's actually also deployed as a Docker container on the instance. Um, Service send all service to service requests to their local Linkerd instance. Uh, all services have a name that other services can talk to it. Um, and then it uses that name to find the services routing in its delegation. So if you look at that delegation, um, and well, it's in yellow, orange, I don't know what color it is. Um, you'll see that uh, the way that it works is that we have service A 
underscore version one, right? So we could have version two, version three. That's the name of the service. Now, the way that we can achieve blue and green deployments, again, would be um, by say, setting it to saying 95% of the requests to this service, service A underscore V1, should go to the blue version of service A, and 5% should go to the green version of service A. So the teams, the individual teams, can actually control this. And you can set blue, green, orange, purple, whatever, and they can control the percentages up to 100%, of course. Um, uh, so some of these things that you know, some of the reasons this could be utilized is that you're rolling out a new version, you want to check it out, verify that your blue version, your green version is, is working right. You look at your logs, make sure there's no additional errors, uh, things like that. Another uh, thing that you could do is to do run experiments. You know, um, I think the, uh, um, during the talk today, uh, Netflix talked about they run chaos experiments, right? So that could be something that says you have a, um, 2% of your requests are going to this service, which is actually creating different problems, maybe. And you want to see how your upstream services react. So, so it gives you a lot of flexibility there. Um, the, the nice thing also about that is that is not a hard and, uh, in Linkerd, that's not a hard and fast rule that that's the only delegation tab that it'll utilize. So what you can actually do is on a per request basis, you can actually send um, a new thing. So for example, let's just say I wanted to route uh, this one request for service A to service A V2 because I want to test this in production. I have maybe some feature flagging. I've done something there. I can actually add a header to the request that's way at the start and that header will propagate through the entire system so it doesn't matter what service ends up using that service, it'll make sure that it goes to the new service. So there's features like that that we were able to um, get out of this. Um, uh, the other thing is that the way that we've um, architected it is that the ECS instances are entirely horizontally scalable and use EC2 auto-scaling groups to scale out when you, it needs more memory, more CPU, or anything like that. So it completely it scales out horizontally because everything is contained in a single um, uh, ECS container instance, it, um, it, it pretty much scales for, you know, pr pretty horizontally. So what we got through this was that we gave the teams the ability to instantly change routing for a microservice. Um, by, modifying that, by modifying that delegation tab for a service, a team can decide where the traffic should go. Um, another feature that we got is Linkerd has some resiliency functions built in. Um, so it can retry if you tell it to, it can retry idempotent requests. So in our world, that's basically any request that's not a post um, is considered an idempotent uh, request. So that's how we design our um, uh, services. And if, if one service returned a, one instance returned to 500, maybe it's just in the process of failing or anything like that, Linkerd will retry um, that individual request against another instance. Um, so your calling service actually never sees issues. So it's got certain features like that built in too. Um, it can tie in with the service discovery backend. Um, so it'll immediately find healthy containers uh, depending on your backend. It could be any backend. Uh, it could be DNS. Uh, we utilize console, but it can be pretty much anything. Route 53, it could be anything that you needed to. Um, another nice feature of Linkerd is that it's able to determine slower instances and route fewer requests to these instances. So if you've worked in EC, um, EC2, if you've worked in a container world, you will unvariably run into a noisy neighbor problem. So being able to look at the latency of the request coming in from a particular um, task is nice to be able to say, hey, I'm just going to give this one fewer requests so that I'm not, I'm not making that instance even worse. Um, so this is all nice. It's never a great world because there are always challenges to be solved. Um, so what does the future hold for us in terms of challenges that we plan to tackle? Um, one issue is obviously security. Security is still a challenge in this environment. Um, task IAM roles are great, but they're, they're only, they only take you so far. Right? They, can, they can talk. You can uh, limit your um, exposure to your data sources, potentially, like DynamoDB or something like that, but not necessarily to other services, right? So um, as uh, kind of Deepak talked about task ENIs, that's a big win, potentially, for PCI or PII data, especially if you're under compliance regula you know, regulations, because the, half the time, 
most people know it's a check the box. Are you doing this? Do you have an ACL? Uh, no. Well, then that you know doesn't you know so being able to have that definitely helps. Um, another another thing that right now Linkerd doesn't really natively understand how to find the closest container. Um, so it does do some of this through the um, latency routing because it'll try to pick containers that are uh, lower latency, but it doesn't really understand that, hey, I want to talk to a container that's maybe on the same instance or in the same availability zone and then in the same VPC, right? Um, although there are some tricks that we can do with the, with the you know, service discovery backend, and again, because we think of it as a kind of a microservice type architecture, you know, we, can, we can do that. So um, that is pretty much what uh, concludes my portion of this. Um, I think uh, thank you would be in order. Uh, it would have been really awkward if uh, none of you guys showed up and we were speaking to an empty room. So definitely thanks for coming. And uh, we're around for our questions. Yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs>